She's just gonna load up and send down some stuff. I'm going down to the shop. <laughs> At the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, artist Kerry James Marshall heads down to the workshop to prepare his painting tools. For his new project, he needs to trim some templates, which look like large storybook flowers. But this is a little bit too big, so sometimes when you're trying to put paint on it to get it on the wall, the paint dries so fast. So it, for something this size, it's a little bit too big to do that, so I'm going to cut it into sections. So it makes smaller sections so it's easier to use. These templates may seem a bit on the large side, but they need to be. He's not painting on a small canvas to be hung on a wall. Rather, this is his canvas. Welcome to SF MoMA's new program, Art in the Atrium. Just a few days ago, the scaffolding went up to prepare for this new installation. The idea is that we have this wonderful, large, open space that is unprogrammed. It's a public space in the sense that you don't need to pay admission to get in. Um, and so we had a notion to try to launch a new program stream that would in allow an artist to come in and sort of do a commission of their choosing, um, and that this would be a sort of work of public art. Marshall is the first artist to be commissioned for this program. For 15 days, he and a team of muralists from San Francisco's Presita Eyes Mural Art Center will paint his two new murals. The murals will live on the walls next to the museum's main staircase. My first proposal was actually not to do anything on those walls. It was to do something on the floor. <laughs> but logistically, that's a lot harder to do because you've got traffic flows and things like that to deal with. But I wanted to transform the entire atrium into something else to try and compete with the architecture of the space, which is really aggressive. Marshall has made a successful career out of being aggressive. For 30 years, he's created a rich body of work shown in museums and galleries across the U.S. Born in Birmingham, Alabama, he later moved to Los Angeles, where he grew up in South Central and later Watts. He now lives in Chicago. His upbringing, which included being the only black student at the Otis Art Institute, made him aware of the role that African Americans play in the art world. His work tackles issues of racial identity, African American history, and urban life. He puts African Americans front and center stage in his paintings, a presence often overlooked in most museums. It's not so ordinary to find representations of black people in the paintings and images you see in museums. And so that's been a part of my project, is because I don't think there's enough. And so a part of what I'm doing is do at least my part. <laughs> to try and produce images that have the capacity to enter into the museum uh, and bring with them the, a, an image that I would like for people to be uh, more used to seeing rather than seeing them as the exception. His images and themes range from honoring civil rights movement heroes of the 1960s, both the famous ones and the lesser known freedom fighters, to celebrations of everyday, even romantic, life experiences of black people. If I do images like the romantic sort of paintings, I mean, I, I think I defy anybody to find them anywhere else in a museum. <laughs> it's like images in, with that kind of context, with that kind of narrative uh, around them, and with that kind of treatment, I, because I don't think they exist. And so it's also it's a part of that tendency of mine to try and express the broadest range of ideas about the way the black figures represent it, the broadest range of contexts, and the broadest range of subjects. I, I use the blackness in those figures as a rhetorical device. And it's also the way you gather and sort of consolidate the most power in those kinds of extremes. And so since the art world is kind of built on projecting a certain kind of power and a certain kind of presence through an image, you know, I'm trying to project the most power and the strongest presence I can, and, and I can't think of a better way to do it than uh, painting an image that's that extremely black, which you have to acknowledge up front. He's one of those artists who really has a kind of um, 
what I like to call a universal genius, which sounds perhaps a little too heavy handed, but in the sense of, you know, like Leonardo, who was interested in everything, right? And Kerry is really interested in everything. He does have this incredible sense of politics and history. He wants to bring something totally new um, to it and, and to be active within that environment. For the SF MoMA project, there is much painting to be done on the murals. Yeah, I was just trying to get this a little deeper. Marshall directs his team as they cover the 27 by 32 foot walls. They got busy and the work has turned out really well. So it's, it's actually been quite a pleasure. We've had great conversations on the scaffolding. I haven't been formally trained like in school or anything like that. So he's actually inspired me to go back into school actually in a lot of ways. The subject here is two historic landmarks. Mount Vernon and Monticello, the estates of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, respectively. They're associated with the founding of the nation, you know, with the idea of liberty, with the idea of independence. But both those men, independents and freedom fighters as they were, were also slave owners. And so it's a complicated and contradictory kind of story. I don't think it's the first thing anybody would tell you in a history lesson about the United States either. It's a kind of glossed over part of the subject. And so I'm interested in telling the whole story. In telling the story, Marshall created the murals in a style you might recognize from preschool. Children's coloring books and activity games. The devices I'm using is to embed the images of black people all the way through the landscape, you know, in expected and unexpected places. None of them are foregrounded in the same way that the figures of Jefferson and Washington themselves are. But the slaves who ran the place, they're hidden in the flowers, they're in the trees, they're in the hillsides, they're in the water. So they're all throughout the landscape. You have the connect the dot images, which when the dots are connected, show a figure. But the dots themselves are also the heads of black figures. And so each of those things that looks like a dot is actually somebody's head. And so that's a way of accumulating the, you know, large numbers of figures in the place without making them so obvious at first. It's more contemplative too. I mean, for, I think for the visitor uh, to come in and um, I, I, I don't, they may not see everything at one time, but if they continue to visit over the next 18 months or so, they'll see um, more each time they come. I'm going to make one that's not quite as good as it. It's been a little mixed uh, messages from the people who see it because they see the colors and it's very playful. And then as they keep observing, then they start to notice like, oh, there's uh, slaves. And then they kind of shy away. But it, it also, the playfulness lets them open up that dialogue, you know. The whole idea of, of doing the coloring book or doing the children's activity book is a way of saying, look, it's open, right? This isn't rocket science, <laughs> you know? Get in there and start relating to history. And I think you always have to ask. So when you, when you have an image like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, you always have to keep asking yourself, why are there so many of these black faces popping up all over the place? What is that about? <laughs> That's a question that I think, when asked, begins to reveal to you what the whole story is. <laughs>